Welcome, Lynn. I see uh, I see you there. Welcome here. It's so nice to see you again. Good to see you too. And so uh, just by way of context, uh, you and I had met at that interfaith um, conference that Safi Kaskas had put on, and I was so moved by by um, what you had presented there that I wanted to get to know you a little bit better and also then interview you for what I, th I think will be um, uh, we'll post this to our students at the at the um, Institute for Religion, Peace and Justice. And just so you know what you're getting into, um, I'm going to explore all your interests if I can, you know, but but your audience will be in many cases uh, uh, people who are interested in peace, but they've actually never met a Jewish rabbi before. And for many of them, many of them, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Many, many of them, their entire um, exposure to 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 the Jewish faith isn't actually through the Jewish faith, but through some kind of you know American Christian Zionism that's left a bad taste in their mouths. And so you are you are a very welcome new voice, a fresh voice for some of those who've not followed your career. So that's um, that's what we're into. But I. How would you how would you introduce yourself? I, I have my bio is is on uh, line, um, and I I will post that too. By the way, so um, I don't know. <laughs> well, let me probe then. <laughs> this is fantastic. So um, I'll tell you what strikes me about you yeah. is you've been a congregational rabbi since um, what year? My this goodness. is my 50th year. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is my rabbinic jubilee year, meaning I have served in a pulpit position, my pulpit being uh across a vast spectrum in terms of the people I serve it's not limited only to a locale a single locality um I'm one of the first 10 women in Jewish history to be, become a rabbi and that doesn't mean there weren't women in spiritual leadership um for the 3,000 years of Jewish peoplehood. Um, but the first person to carry the title rabbi was Asnad Barzani, a, uh, a woman from Kurdistan in the late 15, early 1600s. And uh, she was followed by a few other people um, including Lily Montague and Regina Jonas, who died in the Holocaust um, <clears throat> during World War II. And she she was ordained as a rabbi. And then there was a group of, of seven of us, uh, Sally Prizan being the first, and then a crew of six of us who stepped into the field, into the world, I was, I don't know, 24. <laughs> it was wow. pretty big, like, oh, <laughs> hello. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, and in addition to that, like you're you're a storyteller. I'm a, I, am I guessing right that the artwork I see behind you is something you created? Yes. Yes. This is this is my artwork, and yeah. And a uh, ceremonialist, what does that mean? <laughs> well, um, my, my childhood ideas were formed by several things. One, my mother, uh, may her memory be a blessing, was a puppeteer and taught in children's theater and founded the uh, the Civic Theater, a grassroots community theater in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And so I grew up in that theater and was on stage in that theater by the time I was four, <laughs> you know, and uh, she had a, a um, 
puppet stage in her basement. And through her, I learned story, the art of storytelling. And not just her, but the people around her, including Ralph Senderwitz. And also she worked in a special needs community teaching drama. And so my world um, started to broaden. In addition, it was a time of civil rights and the discovery by the Jewish community, by the broader Jewish community of what had exactly happened um, in the Holocaust. So the rabbinic, the rabbis of my youth in Allentown, Pennsylvania taught never again means never again for anybody. Mm, very good. And they, they created a bridge in the community to many different responses and uh, of, of bringing um, people from the black community to speak in the synagogue. Okay. And so by the time I was in eighth grade, I created my first ceremonial protest, I guess you'd say. Yeah, yeah, prophetic uh, acts, you know. This liturgy, uh, the, really the first liturgy that I wrote and produced, you know, and I'd already been in the theater from the time I was four. I understood theater, yeah. the ceremony. Um, which for me was very different than sitting in a synagogue where your body was barely moving and listening to somebody preach at you, you know? Yeah. Um, so the rabbi, um, this was planned. The rabbi started speaking about issues of civil rights and segregation. And I, stood up in one of the corners with eight other compatriots and we said well what can we do what can <laughs> we do then we marched up on stage and we told the community what we thought we could do <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so you know not much has really changed in my life and that's it <laughs> yeah yeah it's just that my vision has broadened because um in addition to witnessing racism and listening to survivors of the Holocaust tell their stories um, and traveling to Israel in 1966 and listening to Palestinians tell their story and meeting German young people whose parents had participated in the Holocaust and they were the generation after and they were wondering, well, what could they do as acts of atonement? I met them in Israel. So the world was kind of like coming alive. It's like, oh my goodness gracious, what a human history we're, we're living in. And, uh, you know, so then to sort of be processing all that and then step into a role as one of the first women rabbis in Jewish history I mean, that was a lot to ask of anybody, but luckily um, my elders are the people that called me forth. They saw, they saw it in me before I could even, you know, imagine, including Rabbi Stephen Schaefer and Rabbi Zalman Schechter, Rabbi Everett Gendler, and many others who kept... Uh, calling me forth to be a rabbi. In addition to then the community that I stepped into, the community of the world and, and so many Jewish people in the seventies who um, were not fitting into the conventional structures available to them through the synagogue because they were trans or queer or radical or radically politically or non-theological, secular artists, multi-faith, uh, special needs, women in general. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, trans, a time for the tradition to be responsive 
to the people, uh, Jews of color, uh, multi-heritage Jews, to the people who are coming to me uh, to be, for, for all kinds of things, to be responsive um, and to figure out what in the tradition could be a treasure, but what in the tradition was really harmful mm. and things within it that we needed to make conscious repair. Hello, patriarchy. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> that is pervasive. There's no way to get around that. Yeah. Um, right. This so, yeah. So, so that's what I, the world I stepped into and the questions that were, or the, the harms that I saw. Yeah. And then in, in looking at those harms, what are the strategies, tactics, and sources of wisdom that can um, that can both build peace and build thriving communities? Yep. And resist the harm. So those two pieces of, of action, and luckily for me, non the the nonviolent revolution of Gandhi and of um, the, the African-American human rights movements and global struggles against colonialism and many, many, and feminism um, were engaged in new forms of nonviolent struggle, which for me was very exciting. Yeah, nonviolent struggle, that, that's helpful, um, you know, I've only been to I've only been to uh, Israel once, and I I was in Bethlehem for a week. Um, I was in the refugee camps. We went down to Hebron and saw you know, and met with settlers and so on. But any anything that comes out of my mouth about that um, gets labeled anti-Semitic. So I feel like. Um, you you come with a lot of authority, speaking as a Jewish rabbi to to Christians who uh, who have quite a shallow TV view of what's happening there, and who can't hear it from people like me. Um, and maybe that's good, you know. If, what if we have uh, Jewish people, and especially those in 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 authority? and with experience speak for themselves. And so that's one of the things I'm up to right now. And so it was your your call to some kind of um, equity that rooted in the Jewish prophetic tradition really sound, it felt like you were channeling Amos to me actually. Um, so what can what is your perspective on that? What would you want, let's say American Christian Zionists to know um, what feels right to you? Well, I guess, you know, I start with people by saying, can you see through the eyes of Jesus who among you is being harmed beyond your ideology, your theology, your personal status? Can you see harm. And if the only way that you will be able to see that is, is if you take a big dose of humility and realize that the only way to access that kind of vision is to sit silently and listen to those who are being directly harmed by violence. In this case, it is Palestinians. In the historic land of Israel and the historic land of Palestine, Palestinians are living under a brutal form of military occupation in which they have no legal rights, no health rights, no right to travel, no right to, no right to marry and stay with their families. 
uh, no right to safety, no right to food, depending on where they live. So if you can <laughs> remove all the veils <laughs> and assumptions you have and look into that situation, you will see that um, people are being harmed. And then if you see that, you have to realize you don't have the solution. Indeed, you're probably part of the problem. Yes. And we can unpack that, what that looks like, actually, um, why Christian Zionists are amplifying the harm and indeed uh, are the root cause of this harm. Mm. And <laughs> that is a very difficult pill to swallow. Yeah. And it's not... It, it takes a lot of self-compassion to realize and a lot of humility and a lot of faith to realize that all our religious traditions do indeed judge our piety, not by our beliefs, but by the acts we perform in the world and whether they cause harm or whether they help all of us mutually thrive. And um, therefore, it's not Jewish people that need to be heard. It's Palestinians. <laughs> mm. And, uh, you know, to ask why women are hurting, you don't go to men. Right. You know, right. to ask why Black people are hurting, you don't go to white people. Yeah. To ask why Palestinians are hurting, you go to Palestinians. And yes, I have um, spoken in solidarity with Palestinians. And I certainly organize um, according to my own, you know, my, not my own personal, but the way that I see appropriate action should take place within certain principles of centering centering the experience, the wisdom, and the knowledge of directly impacted people by systemic violence. Militarism is not really in Jesus' handbook. <laughs> no, it's not quite in his galaxy even. Um, yeah, so maybe you can help me understand this. I, I live in Canada. And one of the things I can't sort out is why, um, as I'm looking south, in terms of politics and ideology, um, where I see the strongest Christian Zionism would be on the far right. But that's also where I'm seeing anti-Semitism. And, and to me, that looks like a it looks like a contradiction, but I bet it's not. And I think maybe you could help me see what's going on. Well, in there's a basic problem with the way uh, Christian theology has traditionally seen Jewish people. And that is that we are un we 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 are not finished. I think some guy came into my shul one time and said, "Are you finished, Jews?" And we were like, we were in the middle of clean up or something like that. <laughs> First it was like we're finished doing what? It's like and we'll be with you in about uh, lots of weeks. Got <laughs> and then I, we learned this concept from him and. This, this is still pretty much the mindset of Christians toward Jewish people. We are our own diverse, beautiful, complex, living tradition. It may be that our holy books don't reconcile us. That's ultimately we are not going to be reconciled by books right we are going to be reconciled 
through the relationships of love and respect that we build with each other without all the assumptions, because each one of us relates, if we relate to our tradition or a legacy or a heritage, we relate to it in a unique way. Yeah, yeah. And then, and so, so that's one piece. Um, and there's plenty of Jewish people who are anti-Zionist, plenty. And that, that kind of will immediately disrupt and and you know uh, trouble the waters of of Christian Zionists that there are anti-Zionist Jews. Yeah. Jews believe that Zionism is militarism and racism and white supremacy. And the whole idea of it is so negative yeah. to Jewish life and tradition. Mm. According to um, some of our viewpoints, <laughs> because it's rooted in militarism, it's rooted in Jewish supremacy. That's why white supremacists like it. But do they like Jews? No. Okay. <laughs> no, they don't like Jews. They they um, they are using this. It's, it's a very Machiavellian uh very very manipulative perception because um actually the the militarism that is given to israel is really about u.s foreign policy for instance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's why people like supporting israel right it's a military alliance and this idea of the end of time yes right that that's not first of all jewish people don't believe that and i mean there may be an end of time but it's but it's, it's not brought about by instigating armageddon you know that that no, stuff i mean no, that's the most ridiculous idea yeah and it's it's a, an evil idea that somehow uh certain ancient religious um and social philosophies have to triumph but is it going to be equity right or racist racism and empire right right which one of those okay <laughs> so, that's our choices yeah. those are our choices and i think the bible says that choose <laughs> yeah it's up to you to choose it's mm -hmm. in your hands it's mm -hmm. in our hands mm -hmm. But the idea that we would fight for it by killing people. Yeah. That's that's not in Jesus' handbook either. No, like the, the imagining sowing violence to reap peace is has a track record of ludicrousness, uh, I think. Um, well, it might be good in the movies, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People confuse our our psych our desire for some sort of psychic entertainment for living in the real world yeah so you've already talked about a little bit about your you know your engagement with with marginal jews with the black community with women with they're not marginal. they're oh, marginalized marginalized thank you i you know i it's important to me to learn this kind of thing because that can become its own microaggression marginalized which is something done to them right it's uh, it's something undergone they're only marginal from the perspective of the power you know pri well, privilege well, and power yeah that's that, exactly right that, that dominate um but you also like you've had a connection with with the indigenous world and I, that also interests me my my daughter-in-law is half Cree, and um, in Canada, we've been going through a lot of the, the issues around um, finding um, th these children at residential schools and um, the abuse done to them. And it's just it's there's been another layer of of trauma and grief come up um, at the school where I work, where we've begun a, begun an Indigenous studies program on on reconciliation with 
some uh, precious indigenous people uh, leading the way and and I'm so pleased about that and I, I'm watching it carefully because of my relatives so to have you to it kind of surprised me I I hadn't thought about about uh that whole area when I first encountered you and yet here it is a central part of what you're about can you tell me about that experience and your involvement um well it's just been part of my world since i was a child mm. and that it but i mean um traveling to new mexico you know and seeing dances and visiting my uncle there and uh living uh, you know being part of and realizing there is an indigenous world that exists on Turtle Island with, yeah. with uh, their own culture and ceremony and language. That's very comforting to a Jewish kid who's also not uh, normative. Yes, <laughs> yes. World, <laughs> um, you know, where people who carry more than one language and and uh, have and have to learn the enemy's language. Um, it's comforting to see people keeping their traditions. And um, because I lived so many years in New Mexico, it was pretty natural to um, get involved in learning the things that were important to the people living there, which included. Um, protecting sacred sites and um, complying with treaties and learning original names of things and true stories of the history. So no statue of An Onyate, you know, was not, the statue of Onyate was not welcome there. Um, not culturally appropriating um, indigenous ways of life, the, the, the uh, fr fragility of, the, of language and, and what it takes to preserve language. You know, just many, many things. Um, yeah, that just part of my world. And you're connected with this, uh, the way of Michigan. What, what can you tell us about that? Um, well, that's my name for, I guess, my kind of Judaism in a certain way, <laughs> the, okay. way of the, Mishkan, the way of the Mishkan. Mishkan is very diaspora idea. Mm -hmm. That is our, our homeland is the Torah, and we take it with us, our, and our ceremony, and we, we travel with it. And the Mishkan was the image of the, of the sanctuary and it had four directions. And there was a special symbol in each, each of those directions. And there's a world of stories, you know, and ceremony and protocol in each of those directions. And I felt like, um, you know, the idea of the temple uh, which of course synagogues are very important to Jewish life, but in my and I and I started a synagogue in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is going into its 40 some odd year. But my um sense of Jewish community is that we we throw down we throw down a blanket or we or we in our, we invite guests into our homes, we put up a sukkah, we are uh, creating our ceremonies where we live, wherever so, that is. So, yeah, that, that's interesting because it, I mean, that, like from the, your history, right, the, the, the diaspora, and you think about the eras where where your people were in exile and so on so talk talk well, I, about I don't, the, I don't think of it as exile yeah i don't think of it as exile i i don't feel that diaspora means exile diaspora is just that we um have lived many places okay 
We and are, then the book becomes your, or the Torah, or what What did you say becomes your homeland? It's the, uh, the Torah, yeah. So that's interesting because it becomes a portable environment of landedness or something of that. A, porta, a portable environment of culture. Okay. Of uh, spiritual culture. Yeah. And uh, I mean, sometimes Jews have lived in a place for a really, really long time. My my ancestors, I'm Lynn, Miriam, daughter of Sivia, daughter of Bessie, daughter of Delia, daughter of Jenny, daughter of Henrietta, who moved to um, with her husband Wolf to Easton, Pennsylvania on unceded Lenape land in 1839 and founded mm -hmm one of the oldest synagogues in the United States on Turtle Island called Covenant of Peace. So my, my relatives have been here for a while. Um, Jews living in places like Iran have been there for 2,500 years. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, it would be totally off base to call that any kind of exile. It would be. And it, in fact, it would imply you need to leave and go back somewhere. And that's as if this can't be your home and isn't your home. I, I am seeing that. Oh, I'm so glad to be ignorant enough to raise <laughs> these problematic things <laughs> and, and that you're so patient with me. Um, I, uh, I would, I'd be interested in, in knowing um, where to start reading you. Like, I know you've got the book that I'm really interested in right now is "She Who Dwells Within." Are there, is that a good place to start when we're when we're reading about you? Where where would you like us to start? Well, um, let me see if I can pull this up. I think this would be more fun. Okay, I'm actually. I'm into fun. So tell us about this <laughs> yes. book. This is um, called "A World Beyond Borders: Passover Haggadah." Okay. And I think I think it's kind of fun because um, first of all, it's kind of accessible, you know, and and you can read. It's meant to be read out loud. Yeah. And it's got pictures. Did you do the art? Yeah, I did the art. Like this, this one is um, the table of contents, and you can see that little lamb is reading, reading the Haggadah of the liberated lamb. Okay. Yeah. Um, where can we get this? Um, well, I have to I have to order a bunch more, but but I'm about to do that to get them ready for Hanukkah. Uh -huh. So you could get them from me. Um, That's what I want to do. I want to. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, email you about that, and we'll arrange. And then there's there's also which I think is free, and I can I can um, I think it is free, but it was. It's called Peace Primer 2. Okay. And it has actually the Torah of nonviolence, Christian nonviolence, and and Muslim nonviolence. So by three three different people, me, I, I wrote the Jewish part of it. Okay. It's called Quotes from Jewish, Christian, and Islamic scripture and tradition. Okay. Oh, that's excellent. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't at least invite you to tell us a story, because you're like kind of an epic storyteller, but I don't know. Are you okay with this as a venue for that? Do you have one for me? Oh, my goodness. Um, could you maybe point me in a direction? I know so many stories. I'm not sure. Could you? T All right. Let's narrow it down. Could you tell I, me I about a story a from Jewish tradition? Well, yes, I would I would tell you a story from Jewish tradition. About peace, peacemaking, about being agents of peace, or that would give us an idea of what shalom means in its fullness. <laughs> or anything. <laughs> I really I'm so sorry to put you on the spot, but it just I, occurred I was to me. Thinking that, uh, <laughs> um well, I mean what yes that one the one you're thinking mind, about. as you said that was was just a nasruddin story <laughs> when somebody says uh nasruddin goes into the bank 
and somebody says, um, could you show me some identification, please? And Nasruddin pulls out a mirror and he looks in the mirror and he goes, <gasps> yep, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good story. <laughs> that's a good story. I guess it's always good to, you know, kind of start there. Um, the main important thing, as the Kuska Rebbe said, is uh, to keep walking. Don't stop. Just keep walking. And he also said this amazing thing. I thought of a story. <laughs> Okay, here we go. <laughs> I can I can bring a story. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity and gift of leading a delegation to Iran in 2007 or 8, just before Obama got elected. And we went to Jam Karam, which is a masjid, a mosque. And every Tuesday, many people come and pray there because it is said that the 13th Mahdi in Shia Islam, the, the 13th Imam is kind of like the Messiah. And when, when they return, uh, the great time of peace will come. But the people, you know, get very tired waiting. And so once a thousand years ago, the Mahdi appeared by a well of waters and the people saw the presence of the 13th Imam and they were greatly comforted. And so they began to pray there and a custom developed that every day they would put a grill over the well and people would tie ribbons or string on the grill to indicate they prayed. And then they would remove the strings and every day that would happen. So this delegation that I was leading, um, we came into Jam Karan at sunset. It was a full moon, just beautiful. And the men went to pray with the men and the women went to pray with the women. And because I had already been in so many masjids, I was helping and you know, encouraging people and guiding people to um, how to pray. <laughs> Or just to, to sit, you know, making them feel comfortable. And people were so gracious. We come out and stars are bright and we're on our headed back to the bus. And the young imam that greeted us at the gate called my name, Rabbi, Rabbi. And so I turned around, Rabbi, Rabbi. <laughs> I turned around um, and he was standing against the wall. And I saw that uh, the worshipers were come, were on their way home. And so they were leaving the masjid and he started talking to me and he said, he told the story of the Mahdi and he said, and even though this is a very holy, oh, he said, we, we put ribbons around the grill and don't you also have such a place in Jerusalem? Don't you also put papers in a wall and pray to the Holy One? And I said, yes, we have a similar custom where we leave a piece of paper with a little prayer in the wall where we feel the presence still resides. And then he said, even though this place is holy for us, it is not intrinsically holy because the whole earth is holy. Mm. And I quoted back to him the same phrase in Hebrew, God's presence is felt throughout the whole world and everywhere we walk, everywhere we put our foot is holy ground. And he said, and if we harm one another, we're harming the whole. Mm. Because yeah. humanity is like a jewel. And if we harm part of the jewel, we harm the whole jewel. He is quoting, he was quoting the, the poet Saadi. And then I quoted the Baal Shem Tov. If we harm any other human being, it is like we harm the root of humanity because we are all connected 
at the root. Mm. And so we went on like this trading, <laughs> these very yeah. cool and universal um, phrases from our traditions. And I could feel that there was a big presence behind me. And, and I turned around and all of the parishioners had gathered round and our translator had been getting louder and louder. Her voice had been getting louder and louder. And I realized that this conversation that we were having was being carried to the rest of the worshipers that were gathered there. And I thought of the Kutska Rebbe who said, where is the divine? Wherever you let the divine in. Mm. And so we were making this welcoming place for each other. And we were sharing these beautiful ideas with each other. And we created this moment of understanding and peace. Wow. The witnesses that were there will never be the same. I mean, you 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 actually <laughs> established something like sewed something. And it, it makes for a good story as well. It's <laughs> a great story. <laughs> I was <laughs> trying not to tense up. <laughs> um yeah, that's so so good. Well, I I'm grateful for this time. I hope I hope we'll be able to uh repeat this at, um and because I found it enriching, but may, before before I sign off, I'll, I'll ask you two things. One is, is there anything else you'd want me to know today? And the other is, if you would be willing to pray a blessing. We we ourselves can be a blessing. Mm -hmm. um, we. Our prayers are acknowledgments and gratitude and acts of um, healing so we can have mm. the strength to keep on keeping on mm. the difficult road of working and stewarding peacemaking and equity making mm. and I I really my heart goes out right now to Palestinians who the violence against Palestinians is being amplified as we speak and the violence against women and the violence against people of color and the violence against Asians, the violence against migrants, the violence against uh, water protectors and indigenous people. Violence is being amplified and increased. And this is the time for our faith to be a faith of action, to step up and to become part of movements that envision thriving communities and equitable communities where we can live together as we are, no matter who we are, um, but without violence between us. Yeah. And so that's my ongoing, <laughs> my ongoing and forever, forever prayer. Yeah. Um, so may it be for all of us. Yeah. Well, you are a blessing. Thank you so much, Rabbi <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> you too. Thank you for all reaching right. out. I appreciate right. that. We'll yeah. see you. We'll be in touch. Thank you. See you down the road. You bet. <laughs> Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.